I can't help me. She grassing us up. Us. I was, I was, a, 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 you know, what's it to the, to the fact I'm small fry? Yeah, he's smiling, smiling. Oh, maybe we're home and dry. Oh, you know what? We have to start grassing us up, class act. You know what? I'd have a go, but uh, when is a mate? Mm. Oh, She's squashy like a moth. <laughs> Shit, chill. Oh, incoming, Tommy. Oh. The talk of the street. 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 Welcome to episode 313 of the Talk of the Street and another official Coronation Street Catcher podcast that suggests you all get your cocoa and slippers ready because as Nick said to Toya, this is going to be a long one. I'm Gavin. And I would like to know, please, where I can order a baked bean balaclava. <laughs> From the baked bean balaclava shop. Because they look very cosy. And also I feel like I would be the only one here who has one. You just don't see many balaclavas full stop <laughs> not this time of year no not any time of year really sometimes if the winter is bad but we really haven't had a bad winter in ages certainly i would agree that very few if any have been baked bean based <laughs> or any other alliteration for that matter that is true is that your takeaway from <laughs> the 2024 election i i do enjoy the weirdness of the British elections. I, like that time, like that time El- Elmo was running. Elmo Remember that? Was, Elmo was running last night as well. Was he? Mm-hmm. I missed him. And Buckethead. I like Buckethead. Oh, Buckethead. Buckethead is a guitarist for Guns N' Roses. <laughs> you mean Lord Binhead. No, Binface. No, Bucketface. Binface. Yeah. We have a guy that's kind of like him who always runs, who's in New Hampshire but he has a boot on his head as opposed to a bucket. But he's like the only weird one we have. It's really sad. If we had more weird people running, maybe we'd be better off. How are you? Ah, you know, it's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. Excellent. Looking forward to once again having a king. Anyway. <laughs> We have a huge amount to get through this week we because do. last week, when we were under the impression that we only had one maybe or one two. or two episodes, we thought, well, let's just fill some content up by asking or listening several, i.e. you lot, to ask if you had any questions that you might like to ask us as part of a Ask Us Anything Q&A. And boy, did you. And you did. And then the show decided to put three episodes out anyway. Yeah. So we've kind of left now with maybe an extra half hour of Q&A stuff. Yes. That's probably going to push this show over two hours. And I really don't like... Apologies. I really don't like going that long. But mm. the, the, the option was do it separately. But if we do it separately, then maybe not as many people hear it. So... Anyway, we'll just do it as part of our preamble, so we'll we'll sure. get to that shortly. Talking of which, yes. shall we just jump in and get to that? Yes, please. Give us some of that expedited Corey news. Dame Lippman is once again taking a break from the cobbles, this time around to star as Mrs. Potts, only not really because Disney is very litigious in a Beauty and the Beast Panto. I think it's Miss Potty, which I don't know. She's got a she's got a teapot attached to her head. Not so. a potty then. No. No. Not a potty. Because that conjures up certain images. <laughs> right. That maybe Maybe she should be running for government yeah. with a with a potty on her head. Images that perhaps are <laughs> unintended. Yeah, so I she does like to take her breaks. Yeah, good for her. Yeah, yeah. Thelma Barlow, who played Mavis on the show, is coming out of retirement at age 95. Sadly, not to return to the cobbles. 
she has said very, very pointedly no <laughs> to that. But to appear in a short film entitled Sleepless in Settle, which sounds very homey and nice. It does. The show bears no resemblance to the one that Selma Barlow left. Correct. All those years ago, so you, you can't exactly blame her. She gets mentioned on the show an awful lot, but she's like, it's it's not enough. This this film is something that I'm doing with my friends, as opposed to something that's with mostly people I don't know, and far more stressful than than I want to do at this time in my life. So good for her. Yeah, no one wants to see Mavis with a Nick Top Tick pregnancy at 95. <laughs> or involved in a cult. Or, or, watching, or talking to Sam. Or watching a gun float by on a river of water. A river of water, of, you say? A, a river let, of let water. Let me try and imagine that. A river of water okay, coming. Got it. A river of water flowing through the sewers. Which can have rivers of other things other than water. Rivers of shite. Yes. That's thunder, by the way. And finally, Emrys Cooper, who plays horrible Rowan, has made the decision, thanks to his role on Corey, to make like a Dee Dee and move back to the UK from LA, along with his husband, cat, and dog. Well done. We are right behind you. <laughs> wow. A lot to unpack in that. Yes. First of all, he's in L.A.? He was in L.A. Yeah. He has been in seven... He was in Mamma Mia! Well. He was in Mamma fucking Mia. And also, he's going to be in that new Nosferatu movie. Oh, oh no, well. this is a different Nosferatu movie. <laughs> this one came out in 2023 and was directed by David Lee Fisher and not, what's his name, the guy who did the... The Vitch and the... Eggers. Yes, Eggers. Who I like. I just can't remember his name. Ernest Cooper was the meet male lead role in the Emmy-nominated Style Hall drama series, Vanity. There's a sentence that I don't really understand, but it also starred Denise Richards. Yes. Who I do know. Yes, Starship Troopers. And also being married to that horrible man. And Playboy. Yes. I don't know her from Playboy. I may have seen some stills. <laughs> yeah, it looks like Mamma Mia is the thing, is the biggest thing he's ever been in as far as Hollywood is concerned. So, you know, maybe maybe this was the right choice. I'm, I'm scrolling through to see who he played. Uh, stag. He played Stag. He was one of the Stag do guys. There's a whole bunch of people who are either stag or hen, and that's hilarious. I should I should look at the the cast list for Baba Mia more often. Very good. Yes. So well done to him. Yes, he is very attractive when he's not being creepy. It's his hair when he's he's got better hair. He's got better hair when he's himself and not Rowan. Rowan's hair. It, I always am suspicious of people who part their hair down the middle. And that's Corey News. <laughs> On that bombshell. Yes. As the rain pushes it down against our window, let us move into the plain sailing that is our feedback section, Everyone's a Critic. <laughs> Michelle from Canada writes in, with regards to Wendy's list of things the show has forgotten about, how about Nina being an amazing clothes designer? Yeah, no shit. Remember that? Yeah, I remember that. Because the show doesn't. Yeah. Nina was so good that she worked for Carla, and if it wasn't for the fact that her boyfriend got kicked to death, she'd probably still be doing something like that. Yeah, probably. And would maybe have been killed by... Stephen, so right, maybe so it's, maybe, maybe not. It's best to yeah, and up. that's when she she quit going to school for being a, a clothes designer. Remember when she was going to school to be a clothes designer, and then was like, ah, never mind, I have this job in the cafe. Yeah, did that just go away? And she's happy at the cafe now. Seems like it. I always look forward to your podcast. Thank you very much, Michelle. We appreciate it. And then Ellen on YouTube writes. 
Stupid point, but Faye and Craig's theoretical children might not be gingers. Faye isn't blood related to Gary. The Windass family adopted her. Yeah, that's right. I feel kind of sheepish for not remembering that. Biologically, she's Tim's girl. Of course she is. Yes, but we don't know what Tim's hair looked like when, when he I had it. I can see Tim having a little hint. Of red. Yeah. I can see that. Because doesn't he, doesn't he, when he has, like, facial hair, isn't it kind of reddish? I imagine so. Before it turned grey, because I think it's grey now. No, I mean, I've seen him yeah. a yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe. So he's, he's a Viking blood, like me. Whatever. <laughs> And Sharon writes, Hi Les and Janice, so much happened this week after last week's yawn-inducing episodes. Kit Kat's turned into a right nasty piece of work. David has now got his parting halfway down the back of his head. It's the strangest comb-over I've ever seen. But the front still looks like Wurzel Gummidge. I don't think so. It does a little bit. It's a bit, it's a bit deliberately messy. Right, yes, yes. At least he's not tan. I expected him to come back with a tan. Oh, that that'll, be in months. that'll be in months. Again, they've forgotten that the cafe belongs to Nina, so Roy doesn't give a fuck about it and is staying put in the flat. There was a furtive look between Sarah and Kit Kat and Nina's roles. Yes, there was. Yes, there was. And that won't be long before they are rolling themselves. Uh huh. But, but will they? Because. Yeah. They, they one is very will. short and one is very tall. Well, then they just roll in a circle. <laughs> I really like Betsy. I think she'll be a good character. I agree with that. Poor old Toya. She never seems to get a break. Michael and Glenda turned out to be a flash in the pan. You said about Abby and ITV Stefan getting together even though he is the father of ITV Corey, Seb's killer. Well, they've done that story before because isn't Shona the mother of Kylie's killer, Clayton? And that didn't stop her falling in love with David and getting married. That's a very good point. That is a very good point. I thought, well that, is that on the same level? And I think it is. Yeah, because ITV Corey is ITV Stefan's son and Clayton is Shona's son. So, yeah, they keep using old scripts. And that's Sharon, British, not racist, even though they have forgotten about Lauren. Then Chiggy writes, what in the actual fuck is that happening with my favourite show? The writers at this point in the year are just being sadistic for no reason. Why would you give Toya a storyline where she has the ability to be... (coughs) I'm going to save that for later on. Only for it to be, which is arguably even worse. I'm going to leave that for later on as well. Yes. Secondly, I understand the trauma of Roy not wanting to go back to the cafe because it just holds memories for him of all the harassment he received, but he should at least speak to someone about it, like Carl or Evelyn. That's true. If only people spoke to each other. In the interest of brevity, all I have to say about Kit is that he is absolutely deplorable and should not be using his own adoption struggles as a reason to punish Bernie. I know he got let down multiple times, but he has a whole other family to care about him. That's the biggest gift there is, and it's like he's just ignoring it. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much to Chicky, to Sharon, Ellen and Michelle for their thoughts this week. We very much appreciate it. Feedback is always welcome. Send us your thoughts, and I will probably read them out. Get us at the talk of the street at gmail.com, or our DMs are open at Corey Podcast. Please note that we reserve the right to edit feedback, but only in the interest of brevity. Yes. And now let's quickly podcast for coffee. Thank you to Canadian Helen for her coffees this week. Thank you so much. What a lovely Canadian thing to do. It is. Hello, Helen and Gavin. She said today is Canada Day. Yes. Please enjoy some coffees. You had mentioned that you passed through Canada. I was wondering what part. If you're ever in Canada again, you definitely should try the Queen's Head Scottish pub in Oakville. Cheers. Oakville. Have we been through Oakville? We have been to Oakville. We went to Oakville to the movies that time. Oh, that's right. And we also went to Oakville because Canadian Helen told us about a pub, the Dickens, right. that had square sausage and haggis. Yes. So. And haggis poutine. Remember the haggis poutine? So we have trailed through South Ontario. Quite a bit. On more than one occasion, thanks yeah. to hints and tips from Canadian Helen. So we yes. shall have to do so again. Yeah, we really need to branch out and visit some of the other provinces, though. Don't we? Well, if only Oakville would stop having square sausage. <laughs> that would make that far easier to do. 
Thank you again, Canadian Hill, and we so appreciate it. The Talk of the Street is and will always be free on your podcast provider and on the YouTubes. But if you think a show is worth anything more than the time it takes to listen to it, and if you want to show your appreciation, you can buy us next week's coffee by going to ko-fi.com, that's ko-fi.com slash the talk of the street. You can also sign up to be a friend of the podcast through the same link where for as little as two bucks a month you can get a mention in the closing credits of each and every episode. And we now have a Patreon site where you can also show us some love and sign up to be a friend of the podcast. That's patreon.com slash the talk of the street. But remember, you can always support the podcast for free and get us in front of new listeners by liking, subscribing, rating and reviewing wherever you get your podcasts. Shall we QA this up? It's about time. (laughs) If you have no fucking interest in this, I guess this is going to take about 20 minutes. Yeah, but you probably do because some of these questions do have to, do pertain to our opinions about the actual show. They do. Some of them do not. Okay, so Jennifer was the first one to write in. Yes. And Jennifer asks three questions. The first one, which character would you most like to host a podcast with? Glenda. Glenda would be good. Glenda Glenda's would be good. too much like you, though. Yeah, which is why it would be awesome you if need, she and I worked together. You need differing opinions every now and again to bounce against. Eh. I've always said, Helen, that if you, and I, if you and I agreed on everything, then one of us isn't needed. Right. And also, this would have been a very short marriage. Yes. You need a little bit of spice. You, you know do. what I mean? I think Amy would be a good podcast host based on her role at uh, Weatherfield FM or whatever it is. Really? Because we've, we've, we've heard her twice. Yeah, and she was pretty good. Although she lost control of Paul and he did swear. So if she has to keep control over the situation, then she would maybe struggle on this show anyway. Yeah. Sam would be all right if it was a podcast about chess. Why do you only want to do a podcast with the children? Do you really miss Amy's the Amy's not a child. Did you really miss the square cast this much? Yeah, going through uh, SpongeBob Squarecast again in the last couple of days to put some of our old patron episodes for that on for general release. Uh-huh. Yeah. I do miss doing that. That was yeah. good fun. It's so weird to see hear Stelly's voice change over time. Get deeper and deeper. Yeah. She's like Barry White now compared <laughs> to how she was at the start of it. And she's not Barry White. <laughs> no. Yeah, so I think Sam or Amy, so long as it was chess and swearing. What was do you allowed. know about chess? I don't know anything about chess. That's yeah. why Sam would teach me. He's determined to teach <laughs> sounds, someday about chess. Sounds like a terrible podcast. <laughs> it doesn't sound like a podcast I would listen to. No. Wonder who else. My podcast with Glenda would be rating our favorite show tunes and talking about musicals. Because you hate musicals, so it's I not do. as fun to talk with you about it. Although we had a delightful conversation on the List of List podcast about Oliver. We did. I liked that because I was in it Yeah. when I was a kid. Yeah. Unfortunately, all the musicals I was in as a kid did not win Best Picture at the Oscars. Daniel would be a good person to have on the List of Lists. Oh, he's so opinionated. Yeah, but he knows nothing about popular music or movies just old dusty books yeah if you need somebody to talk about old dusty books he's your guy (laughs) next jennifer asks what northern phrases do you enjoy slash miss the most don't know how many northern phrases you'd be familiar with or that i would miss i like it i like it when they say mint i hate mint really mint that's the reason that i don't listen to the sofa cinema club anymore that's not why I don't well, listen to this. Well, <laughs> one of the reasons. That and the fact that they don't talk about movies anymore. I love the word mafting or to maft, which is to sweat. Yeah. Like I'm currently mafting because it's pretty hot in here because I've got that window shut because it's raining outside. Yes. But it's such a descriptive word, I think. If you didn't know what mafting meant, I think. You'd figure it I out. I think you'd figure it out. Yeah. There's lots of words that, like in Scottish, uh-huh. like to get a, an inoculation is to get a jag. Uh-huh. And I think that's a great word because it so accurately describes what it is. See, I don't like jag because it kind of implies that they slip a little bit and make a jagged edge on your skin. I prefer jab. 
Yeah, people do say jab. Yeah. Cause when that's I like, grew up in Scotland, it was jag. You're going to get your jags. Because it's the quick in and out with the jab. You know what I'm saying? I do know what you're saying. <laughs> and I always like the phrase that your jacket is on a sugarly peg. Oh, I love sugarly. Sugarly is a good word. Sugarly is a great word. And your jacket being on a sugarly peg, meaning that you're about to lose your job. Sugarly meaning wobbly. Yeah. That's a great word. But again, more Scottish than Northern. Yeah. But yeah, mafting for me, I just hate mint. I love mint. Oh, that was great. That was mint. Yeah. No. no I... Well, see, as a reseller, I like things to be in mint condition. You do. So, mm-hmm. so using mint to describe something that's great, you know, that's why I have a fondness. I also enjoy the flavor of mint. So it's al- it always sounds delicious when people say things are mint. Jennifer's third question, which unlikely character would you most like to see revealed as the next serial killer on the street? My pick would be Michael and Glenda. Perhaps they accidentally killed George, hide him in a coffin and get a taste for murder. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that wouldn't be bad. No. It would involve killing George though. And he's redeemed himself a little bit this week. He has. Ruby. <laughs> Ruby, no one expects Ruby. Nobody expects Ruby. Everybody's looking at Hope. If there's going to be a serial killer in that house, Ruby's the last person to think of. Ruby and Joseph. Do you think they'd ever have like a child serial killer? I think it would be interesting. A A friend of ours just like did a post on Facebook asking people to list their favorite movies with with children who murder people Mm -hmm. you know we need to talk about kevin yes that's what the one i mentioned so only one i can think of oh um children of the corn oh true uh the the omen the kid doesn't really kill anybody doesn't damon like push his own mother off a cliff or something or am i thinking of the of a different he seems to accidentally knock her over a banister accidentally yeah maybe he does because it's normally the, the malevolent forces that do it. Right, yes, but he's the he's the son of the devil, so he is a malevolent force. Gee, you're the son of the devil once and you get a bad rep for the rest of your life. <laughs> what about making Gail's exit story a serial killer story before she just loses her shit with her entire family? <laughs> I can see it. And then rushes to Thailand. Right. Which would be in character for a serial killer, I think. Right. And then kills Evelyn, or not Evelyn, Eileen, who I think is still there. <laughs> Once in Thailand. Yeah. Right. Or they run off together. That would be hilarious. Because, you know, they hate one another, supposedly. Yeah. Oh, they definitely do. Right. But thank they both you. get a taste for blood. Thank you very much, Jennifer, for those questions. Moving on, Mark has a question that Ian Les Paul kind of asks as well. Mark's question is, what other podcasts do you regularly listen to? And Ian Les Paul's question is, I've occasionally wondered if you two ever listened to Conversation Street, the UK Corey podcast. It must be tempting to hear their reaction or to hear another opinion. I have never heard either of you mention the other, the exception being when you commented that they had received something or other from the show. Is this you both being all professional? Well, let's handle the first part first, shall we? What other podcasts do you listen to, Helen? Oh God, loads. But my favourites are... Films to be buried with with Brett Goldstein, and uh, Last Culturistas with with Matt Rogers and um, Bowen Yang, who is the only reason to watch Saturday Night Live anymore, and um, and Keep It with Louis Fertel and um, Ah, it's at the tip of my tongue. The other guy who's on it, he's the third. I- Ira. Ira Madison the third. There we go. So I really like, you know, other kind of pop culture podcasts and movie co- podcasts. Oh, Linoleum Knife with Alonzo Duraldi and, and his husband. Mm. Um, so, yes, I prefer movie podcasts. And with the exception of Brett Goldstein, podcasts hosted by gay men. <laughs> when we drove to Philadelphia. Uh-huh. And you were driving, and the rule is whoever's driving has control over the yes. the stereo. It was predominantly gay men podcasts. Yes. And by predominantly, I think I mean exclusively. Pretty much. Yeah. Yes. I, on the other hand, 
like lesbians on my pod. No, um, <laughs> my podcasts typically are the ones that aren't soap based because there are a few, but we'll get to them. I listen to comedy podcasts. I like listen to the Taskmaster podcast. Uh, off menu with Ed Gamble and James A. Caster, which is I love that excellent. Uh, the Gargle and the Bugle. Mm -hmm. I haven't listened to the Bugle in a while. Yeah, and then I think it's not there's, the same without John Oliver. It isn't. And then there's some I think that most people listen to stuff you should know. Yeah, I go through phases of not listening to that for weeks though. We are both subscribed to stuff you should know, so it's hilarious. Sometimes I will be listening to it in a room. And then you will come in and you are listening to it as well. Only you and I are in different parts. I like all the stuff. Well, I don't like all the stuff podcasts, but yeah. Stuff you missed in history class and stuff your mom ha didn't tell you. Those are also pretty good. Mm -hmm. They're about feminism and history. And I do like indie podcasts wherever possible. I like listening to podcasts that are just folk like us that are sitting in the room somewhere. Mm -hmm. With a window shut because it's raining outside. Yeah. Typically, though, they have terrible, terrible opinions, like that horror podcast, which <laughs> really needs a sound editor desperately. And neither one of them have good opinions, but one guy's opinions are so much worse than the others. Yeah. They get their wives on, and every time they do, I'm like, why do you do this? Because you just sound like a total dick when you're speaking to your wife. I guess I can do that. Really? <laughs> I never noticed. Yeah. Not on this podcast anyway. No. <laughs> Save that good stuff for the list of lists. As far as Conversation Street is concerned, I don't know if people think that there is some big rivalry between us or not. Any There's relationship not. that we've had has been very pleasant. Yeah. I mean, we're, we follow each other on Twitter. I haven't listened to Conversation Street in a while, I have to admit. But no, it's I not, haven't listened in years. But it's not for any other reason than I don't want to be swayed by any opinion if, if we're talking yeah. about the same thing at the same time i'd rather if we're saying the same thing i would rather it came spontaneous yeah just because that's what we think rather than you know you when you listen to someone that's, that's talking about the same thing that you're talking about i think it's probably quite easy to to let opinions be formed based on that either subconsciously or consciously and, right and i think it's just easier just to not to but i do listen to their end of year awards I typically listen to that every year and i think from what i can gather by a question that was asked on twitter along the same lines i think they feel the same way so it's nothing it's not because this is a competition or anything so no there's room for an american and a british and a canadian yeah and i do listen to the canadian one uh north of weatherfield because it's like a month behind right and I listen to Neighbours and Neighbourhood Rewatch for Neighbours and I listen to Coastal News for Home and Away, despite the fact I don't really watch Home and Away. Mm -hmm. I haven't watched it in a while. So I do like I do like keeping up to date with my soap podcasts. Mm -hmm. I do not. You don't listen to, no. <laughs> to any of them. In fact, if you had the choice, I'm not sure you would want to contribute to one either. Probably not, no. <laughs> All right. Moving on, Chloe then writes from Nova Scotia. Helen, as a fellow collector of vinyl and books, what resources do you have to put a value on these things? I'm just wondering if I have a fortune sitting down in my basement. For vinyl? This is an auction talk question. Yes. Do you want to push the button? Sure. Auction talk. All right. So for vinyl... And also for like tapes and, and CDs and also reel to reel and A tracks, there's a great website called Discogs. And on Discogs you can you can look up different records and stuff and it'll show you all the different variations and everything. But it also has this great feature where they show you the lowest, the mid, and the highest a particular record has sold in recent past on that particular website. So I use that an awful lot when I'm valuing records, especially at work. For, for books, um, especially for work, 
I use a website called Live Auctioneers. And if you are signed up to Live Auctioneers, you can see what things have sold for. So I use that an awful lot because we also at work sell on Live Auctioneers. There's also a website called Via Libri, which will show you what a particular book is selling for, for a variety of different book websites. And it's nice because it includes Amazon from multiple countries. So that can be very helpful. Um, it Unfortunately, it doesn't sell, show sold prices, but it gives you a good idea what other people are asking for a particular book. So you can kind of find a, a medium ground there as well. Hopefully that answers your question. I'll do exactly the same. <laughs> then John writes, with everything that's going on in the street, I wonder if anyone will have time to cast their vote in the general election. I thought it'd be fun to ask you how some of the characters might be politically minded. What do you think, Helen? Well, Sally's a Tory, obviously. Is Sally a Tory or is Sally more reform? See... I don't know. I just know that if Sally lived in the U.S., she would have voted for Trump. Then she's more reformed then, I think. Yeah, yeah I think Would she have voted for Trump, do you think? I think she would have. I think she would have. I think she would have been impressed by the gold toilet. <laughs> yeah, maybe. You know, I think she, she would have been swayed by watching far too many episodes of The Apprentice. Maybe. Yeah. I think pretty much everybody else is liberal. Maybe not Dev. Liberal? Yeah. Labour. Labour, yeah. Yeah. Salford, the constituency that Coronation Street, I guess, would be in, uh-huh. has been Labour forever, I think. Yeah. So, yeah, most of them, I think, would probably be... Labour. Be Labour. Adam, now would Adam be SNP? He doesn't get to vote for SNP in Salford, mm, but... No. Just because he's Scottish also doesn't mean to say that he's going to be SNP, obviously. That's, that's, but that's if we want to separate someone out from that Labour chunk, maybe maybe Adam would be the Yeah. Would be the one. I think Dev might be reform as well, the more I think about it. Because he likes to golf and he owns a business. And he also seems like he would be the kind of person who would be swayed by the apprentice. I'm not sure that he's in the reforms demographic however right yes that's true so maybe maybe um conservative maybe just a tory a tory yeah yeah dev dev could be a tory <laughs> i'm giving him permission to be a okay. tory okay yeah everybody else is labor even ken yeah ken may be a liberal ken would maybe be a liberal i mean i think the older you get the more right wing you get yeah i think there's some people that go the opposite of that Mm -hmm. become even more liberal either way the older you get the more extreme you get well see they kind of keep everyone almost asexual as it as as far as politics is concerned unless it's to do with the storyline that the people that are right wing are very right wing griff and his gang very right wing see everyone else kind of occupies this kind of central ground see this is a thing with griff and what's the closest thing to a libertarian in the uk because i feel like he would be a libertarian uh, probably reform yeah small government right small government but also vegan you know what i'm saying <laughs> yeah see vegan doesn't really go well with that i don't know yeah because cause he's he's racist, but he's also for the environment. He's it's, environmentally racist. Right. <laughs> Which is weird. So he would be green. <laughs> wow. I know some very racist people in the Green Party here in the United States. We so I, I feel like I, I am free to say that. We are very detached from UK politics. If, we are. If, if the last two minutes hasn't already told you that. <laughs> or maybe he'd be a socialist. Trisha writes, do you have any unpopular opinions or hot takes on the show? Mine is that I don't really like the Roy character and I feel bad even typing that out. You should. You should feel bad about typing that out. I feel like all of our, you know, hot takes we mention on a weekly basis. My hottest take, I think, is I never really cared for Bet Lynch. <gasps> <laughs> even I like Bet, and I never watched an episode she was in. I found Bet kind of scary. What? 
when I was a kid, she was very scary. Or she scared me in a way. And I always... Was it the cheetah print? I don't know. I, I never got Bet. I never got everyone's fascination with Bet, both on the show and off the show. Because everyone in the everyone in the street loved her, more or less. I never really got that. It's because she worked in the pub. Men wanted her, and I didn't really get that either. So maybe that's my hottest take, is my, mm. let's say, ambivalence towards Bet Lynch. My hottest take is I could take it or leave it. <laughs> <laughs> Which I guess is not really a hot take. Well done. <laughs> Christy says, I'm seriously considering starting a podcast for my non-profit, but there's so much information on how to begin. In your experience, what is the best place to start? And what are the absolute must-haves in terms of equipment and software, etc.? Two microphones. Or just one microphone. Well, yeah, depending upon how close you are to your co-host. Or if you have a co-host. Right, yeah. Maybe Christy doesn't want a co-host. No. Yeah, when we started... We started with, with two lapel <laughs> mics. And yours fell off and halfway mine through. Fell off, no, mine fell off before it, the podcast started, before I hit record. <laughs> and you didn't notice. And I didn't notice until we were done. And you <laughs> said, well, there's no fucking way I'm doing that again. No. <laughs> so I had to go through and individually boost my vocal. Right. Because it was your mic sitting on the other side of the room that was picking me up. Yeah. And not well. So that was the first episode that I don't think you can get anymore. I oh. think there's only 200 episodes on, on Apple. But we got a Blue Yeti mic for 100 bucks. Yeah, and that was nice. And that was really good. Yeah. Blue Yeti's a good company. The Blue Yeti, however, will pick up a squirrel farting outside your room. <laughs> so it does pick up everything. Yeah. If you want to get something that's... A bit better, a bit more focused. Like these are these are dynamic mics. So when I move away like this, you can't really hear me all that well. But I right. have to come back in here. Yes. But to start off with, your phone—that's all you need. Right. Yeah. You need your phone, and you need an idea. Yeah. And it's pretty much it. And then if I don't know, you don't even need a podcast provider because we've got Podbean for this, and we use Buzzsprout for our other podcasts. And there's, there's six and two threes between them. I think, right. I think they're both easy enough to use. Podbean are doing these ads now where you can record on your phone straight to the app on your phone and that's it. Yeah. Uh, and it will post it to uh, Apple and Wherever. Spotify and all that sort of stuff for you. So it really is super simple, much simpler now than it was six years ago when we started out. Yeah. And even then, it. It's it's not as complicated as people like to pretend that it is. No, I'm I'm make it more complicated you by do. editing stuff. Lots of people don't edit anything. Right. And we well I've spent a bit of money to get kit that I like, but again right. most of this isn't entirely necessary. No. Headphones no. and separate mics and You like kit. Oh, and kit as far as, you know, equipment sort of kit. Gear. Mm hmm. Yeah. Not necessarily kit on the street. But your phone and an idea, Christy, and I think you've got the idea. Absolutely. So that's all you need. And I tell you something, that the, the funniest thing for me for doing podcasts now compared to six years ago is we I used to record it, edit it, and then worry about have I edited it well enough? Mm -hmm. And so I'd maybe listen to it again before posting it. Now we record it. I edit it once and I post it without thinking now. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's a kind of fuck it. Yeah. In a bucket. <laughs> yep. In a bucket head. So you you can overthink it. Definitely. And you know what, Christy? We're only three hours south. <laughs> if you ever need help or a co-host, <laughs> we're only three hours-ish Same south. time zone. Yep. Yeah. And then finally, Pickles has got a couple of questions for us. First... How did you two meet? Was it like a 90 day fiance type of situation? <laughs> we belonged to the same writer's workshop website um, called Scrawl way back in the day. Mm. 2006, 8, 
Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Like 20 years ago. And uh, so we were like, you know, offering suggestions for one another's writing and stuff. We were both married to other people at the time. And then you wanted to start a journal and you asked me to be your poetry editor because you didn't write poetry at the time. Mm. You were more of a short story guy. You're still kind of more or less a short story guy. I'm not a writing kind of guy anymore. Except for notes for Coronation Street. And, True. And memes. <laughs> Which are kind of like short stories. They're like, you know, Ernest Hemingway short stories. Anyway. Anyway. So we started working on that together and then one thing led to another. And then we both got divorced. And you came to America. And the rest was history. Well, I had separated from my wife when this journal was about to start and you'd separated from your husband i think you might have been divorced at the time separated but not divorced yet so so yeah so i hadn't been in the u.s for the longest time and i used to love coming over here on vacation and i hadn't done that so i came across after i'd separated from my wife and we met up and i introduced I came back you to the blues and yeah that was that was that. And Korean food? And then I applied for a job over here and that took not very long to get, but an awful long time to get a visa for. And what was a kind of simple story became a very complicated story. Right. But that was it. It was all above board, yes. Pickles. I insist. Yes. In fact, that was an important thing for me was to get over here on my own merit. Right. And not through a fiancé thing. So right. So I got over on a... Yeah. Work visa. And even for you, a white guy who speaks English, it wasn't necessarily easy. No, it would have been a lot harder had I not spoken English, though. Right, yes. And had a, a job here that was willing to pay for lawyers and yes, stuff. Yes, exactly. And Pickle's second question, what the heck is the difference between a bacon barm and a bacon butty? Okay, you're going to have to handle Help this. Help me to learn the UK language. I figured out that all right means how are you, and ta means thanks a lot. Am I right? Yes, you're right on that. The guy that I sit next to at work wanted to know, if we were sitting in Scotland, what would he say to me when he came in in the morning? And I said, you would say all right. So now he does. So now he comes in and he goes all, all right. right. And I go all right. <laughs> what you don't do when someone says all right is tell them how you are. <laughs> You just say all right back. Yeah. Don't say all right. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm fine, actually. Thanks Thanks for asking. You don't say no, that. No, People in the United Kingdom do not care. A bacon barm and a bacon butty are the same thing, more or are less. Are they? Yeah. Is it a different kind of bread? It's a roll in bacon. Like a, a bap would be a big roll. But like a morning roll, I would still call that a bacon butty or a roll in bacon. In the north of England, you would call it a bacon barm. Okay, so it's it's a regional thing. Yeah. Okay. But that could also be two slices of bread, I think, would be a bacon butty. We have or maybe so many just different words for bread sandwich. and sandwiches. If uh, Inuit people have a million words for snow, the British have millions of words for different types of bread you can put bacon on. Yeah. We have lots of words for sandwiches too. You do. Hoagies and heroes and... Grinders. Mm-hmm. And sandwiches. There we go, that's four. <laughs> and then we have very lengthy... Do, do they have very lengthy discussions and arguments in the United Kingdom about whether or not a hot dog is a sandwich? No. We have long and lengthy discussions over whether Jaffa cakes are a cake or a biscuit. Mm. And they're cakes. And I'm not hearing another word about it. Sure. And that brings us to the end of our Q&A. Thank you to everyone who wrote in with a question or a few questions. That was a lot yeah, of fun. That was fun. We'll maybe do this again sometime. Maybe yeah. do it, I don't know, maybe once a year, a couple of times a year, something like that. Once a month. <laughs> maybe not once a month. I do like talking about myself, though. Hey, who doesn't? <laughs> All right, we are about half an hour later than normal for me to say, shall we dive in, my dear? Yes, please. No time for jokes this week. I our think we've already line, told some. Our first storyline tonight is... Tommy OMFG. On Monday, it's Steve's birthday and Amy is sending him to an escape room with the hope that he'll fail to get out. Steve expects a surprise and goes off for a bath and a huff, so Ken phones around the guest list 
and ruffles up Rita and Brian. Belter. Brian is disappointed that no one else is coming because everyone else is working and when Steve comes down from his bath, he's far from impressed. Brian lets it slip that Sally and Tim are at Tommy O's due in town and now Steve is apoplectic with rage. Cassie has an idea for revenge that also means that they can ditch this fucking party and the cast of Cocoon with it. So the go that's, that's harsh. That's harsh towards Mary, isn't it? Mary's not there. I thought she was. No, it's Rita and or Brian. No, no, Brian. See, this is why I was confused because when I think Mary, I think Brian. That's harsh to you Brian, fl- isn't it? <laughs> yeah, because they're supposed to be an item, even though they're not. And I'm still mad at the show for that. Another thing they forgot. You just deflect him from thinking that Mary was there. <laughs> it kind of sounds like you are. So they go to the rape hotel and without challenge, they're able to find the bust of Tomio's head. Which is terrible. It, it, and also hollow. It reminds me of the I Love Lucy statue that they, that they uh, replaced because it was so heinous. It reminds me of the Rocky statue we saw in Philadelphia that looked like Elvis. I didn't get that close because I was looking for a bathroom. So, yeah, it's a bit shite. Later, the function is in full swing. Tommy O arrives and he's schmoozing with the the great and good of Weatherfield. And he, uh, after a little speech, unveils his bust, which has been swapped out for a football with a goofy face drawn on it. For Wilson from from the... (laughs) Castaway. Yes. That was hilarious. (laughs) And it cut to Tim... Sally and Kirk and Tim and Kirk are kind of screwing up their faces and Sally's smiling broadly because right, she yeah. thinks this is modern art. It's not meant to be representative, Kirk. Right. Well, the actual bust isn't really representative either. <laughs> no, and it's, it's meant to be. hollow. Meanwhile, Steve and Cassie are hightailing it with the bust. The next part of their plan is to sneak into Tim's house using his spear key. Tim and Sally get home, now abreast of the situation that the actual bust has been stolen. But they're gagging for their hole ahead of Come Dine With Me and they're shocked to find the bust under the sheets, <laughs> like the Godfather. I, that's exactly what I thought of. I thought of the horse head. Yeah. <laughs> that was hilarious. Tim rushes round to number one with the bust and while Steve shouts at him for lying and betraying him, Tim gets wired into Steve's cake and they make up, wondering what on earth they're going to do with that fucking bust. Yeah. That was very funny. That whole that was thing funny. was funny. I liked the, that. From the cast of Cocoon onwards, I thought, yeah, this is <laughs> this is great stuff. Then the, the drawing off Tommy O on the football yeah. is like a child has done it. But you know which what? Which means it could either be Cassie or Steve. Right. But also, it looks more like Tommy O than the bus does. <laughs> yeah, that's true. On Wednesday, Tommy O's head is on the dining table at number one. Cassie thinks Steve is reluctant to throw him out because he still loves Tommy O and she hands him a hammer to smash him up but Steve can't in the pub Tommy O's head theft is all over the papers and is the talk of the street town Tim begs Steve to give it back but Steve wants to bury it in Tim's garden (laughs) but Tim has another idea and when Tim has an idea it usually involves dressing up Yes. So they dress up as delivery men and return to the rape hotel with Tommy O's head in a box. What's in the box? What's in the box? John Doe has the upper hand. <laughs> they leave the box in the foyer and are about to bolt when a security guard stops them for the suspicious package. But luckily, Debbie's dressed as Shawadi Wadi and she intervenes. But when Steve picks up the box, Tommy's head falls out the bottom. <laughs> And makes a very hollow sound Clonk. when it hits the ground. Clonk. Their story doesn't check out for Debbie. They claim to have found the bust in a park. And she tells them to take the weight off their personalities while she calls the club. So then a club secretary and Tommy O arrive to pick up the bust. Tommy O is instantly suspicious but decides to just to let it go. Later, Steve and Tim are mopping their brows with Cassie in the pub when Tommy O comes in with two season tickets warning Steve not to lose the team that he loves as well as his wife who Tommy is currently boning. Cassie nabs both tickets for some reason and shoves them into her bra. Yeah. And that's as far as we get with that. Yeah, this she's week. like, neither one of you deserve this, these, even though I don't care about football at all. Yeah, Tommy was like, look, this is the last olive branch that he's going to yeah. hold out, I think. Yeah. Steve's pretending that he doesn't really care for county anymore. Right. Which I think is why 
Tommy O doesn't pursue this any right. further. Yeah. He's happy just to let it go. Yeah. But Steve was kind of adamant that he's not going to. I thought this whole thing was hilarious. It was very funny. It was very funny. Terrible props, but funny. I thought you'd have more to say about seeing Steve and Tim dressed up like you, like you've always wanted. They're they're just wearing reflective jackets, for, vests from construction workers. It's but not really getting dressed up. It's got a costume. It's not really a costume. They're dressed like construction workers from the YMCA. No, because construction workers from YMCA just had the hat. They didn't have the vest. So I was thinking about the last time that they dressed up as construction workers, and I think it might have been the the Sally storyline when Sally was getting done for fraud mm. by that guy. What was that guy's name? I don't remember. No idea. No. This is not what I miss. What I miss is when they wrap one another up in tape and pretend to be Tyrannosaurus Rexes. And they also dress up as dinosaurs for uh, fun runs and things. They've done that before. Have they, have or the are you actual, just remembering something else? No, they have. When have they ever done a fun run on the show? Oh, they've done the fun run several times. Cause, have they? Because Robert takes it very seriously before he dies and then doesn't get a funeral. Right, and then they never do them again. No, but they do do them. They have to do them to not do them again. <laughs> I don't remember a single one. They had a heart-to-heart sitting in the community garden, both of them dressed up as dinosaurs, I'm sure. I means you can't remember that. Because it did. No, it did, because if I'm making it up, it involves him ran masturbating. And <laughs> Please, would you stop with that? It's embarrassing. Do you think Steve has let it go? <sighs> Honestly, I don't really care. I thought that this little this little thing was funny, and I enjoyed it. But I don't really care about Steve's relationship status. No, I don't think this is going to go anywhere. This was just... Steve's 50th and how, how he was feeling a bit lonely and stuff and right. just a bit of fun to cover up but again Tracy hasn't shown up and and maybe that is the last that we see of Tracy oh well oh moving well. on to the curse of the Winter Browns on Monday at the shop Bernie tells Dev that she doesn't know how to break this news to Paul and Gemma although why she waits until she's standing in the shop to talk to Dev about this God only knows right yeah don't they talk to each other at home well maybe this isn't really pillow talk that's maybe why, maybe that's they have they... like sexy talk at home, which embarrasses the twins. Gemma comes rushing in and Benny suggests that they all meet up later, season the moment, kinda. In the cafe later, Kit comes in and makes an arrangement with Bernie to meet in the pub before speaking to the twins, but instead he goes straight to the God flat and rather abruptly breaks the news solo. I'm your brother, he says. And your mom's a bitch. To a shell shocked Gemma and Paul, Kit explains his history. How Bernie tracked him down and he paints a rather bleak picture of Bernie getting pushed yeah. and standing them up ten years ago and says Bernie doesn't want him to meet them. That's Which Paul is a lie. Gemma, even till today. And that, that's really the first lie that he tells. Right. Everything else that he's told is it's could not, be just his perception of it. Right, yeah. It's, it's not a lie, but he's 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 leaving out the part where she was terrified to meet him. And he's also leaving out an awful lot of why he was adopted out to begin with, mm. which she has sort of explained to him. And he's making it out like he was abandoned. And that's, 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 not, that's not how this works. This isn't, a, this isn't a novel by Charles Dickens. You know, women, women make very hard choices with... Lots of things that pertain to their bodies and the children that come from them. And to paint with broad strokes the idea that women who give up their children for adoption are horrible people is not great. And, and Kit is not the only person it, this week who does so as, as this, this news gets out to other people. And it's, it's not a great look. But maybe this is just how he feels about it. Maybe he is hurt emotionally by the whole thing. I think, and that's fine. I think more the the standing up when he was twenty one thing seems to have really cut deep. Right, and that's fine. But like I said, he's not the only person. 
like Gemma especially seems appalled that any mother would ever give away their child well, really and refers to abandonment and everything. Well, that's why I said the show overall is painting adoption in very broad strokes here. And it's not, it's not a great look. Paul and Gemma are disgusted while Kit secretly smirks. Bernie thinks that she's been set up at the pub, so goes round and annoyed that Kit has set her up. She tries to tell her side of things, but it doesn't sound good when she says them, and it doesn't sound good when and she nobody's says listening to that her. she didn't tell them because of the shame. Paul is fuming at the way Bernie has treated Kit, and Gemma thinks Bernie has been playing favourites. Kit is obviously loving this, and says the only reason that she tried to find him was as a, as a replacement for the dying one. And Bernie, fucking furious at this, lobs a remote control at Kit. Right. So Gemma <laughs> kicks her out. Which everybody treats like she threw a knife at him. Right. It's a remote control. It's not going to hurt him. I don't know. It He's looked so like the, tall. It's just going to like bounce off his chest. It looked like the back broke off it and the batteries fell out, so I don't think it was entirely victimless. <laughs> Kit continues his spiel, saying that Bernie's treatment of him has made him the man that he is, so maybe it's not such a bad thing after all. He's very careful when she's not in the room to sound quite magnanimous about it right. and, and being the bigger man. Gemma can't believe how lovely Kit is. Isn't he lovely? And Paul agrees. Kit leaves to check on Bernie in the community garden. Kit says that he gave her a taste of her own medicine, getting stood up and having her family turn against her. Bernie refuses to be wound up, even when Kit calls her scum. Right, yeah. And also, Kit was a baby when she put him up for adoption. So there's never been a time in Kit's life where he's, he's had a great family, a better family, arguably, his whole life. So he's making these comparisons that are not really great because it's not like he was a child who remembers being abandoned. Does he that stop you from feeling abandoned, though? Like, our dog doesn't remember being abandoned when he was a puppy, but he still has abandonment issues. I think he does remember. I think, I think there's, like, sensory memory there. Maybe that's true for Kit as well, then. Hmm. The dog's more like a five-year-old than a infant, right? Is that right? I don't know. You, as far as I know, making this up as you're going along. No, there's like people have like studied like the intelligence of a dog compared to like a human child, and I think dogs are like a five-year-old, and cats are like an eight-year-old. Again, don't know. though, I think I think his issues are more from what happened ten years ago, not what happened. 31 years ago. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that has scarred him quite a bit. Yes, I, I do agree with that. But his his reaction to that scarring has been quite devastating to other members of the family. Right. And the fact that he's doing it deliberately and seems to be taking some pleasure from it. Right, it's cruel. It becomes cruel at that point, it, yeah. It's especially cruel, I think, to Paul. Because he's creating this wedge between Paul and his mother. And Paul doesn't exactly have a lot of time left to be angry at his mom and then slowly reconciling with her. Yeah, he doesn't I, have that time. And I think we get something more along those lines on Wednesday. Where Bernie has once again left until the next day in the shop to complain to Dev about Kit and how he's tearing her family apart. Dev is sure the kids will come round in time if she lets it. Then just to rub it in... Craig and Beth come in and Craig announces that Kit is his hero and the kind of copper that he wants to be when he grows up. So that's nice, isn't it, Helen? Well, fuck you, man. You've got D.S. Swain right there. She's a better cop than Kit ever will be. Meanwhile, at the Godflat, Paul, Gemma and Billy are picking the bones of the Kit stuff. Billy is open-minded to know Bernie's side of things, but the twins are reluctant to listen and instead have arranged to meet Kit for beers on their own. On the street, Kit bumps into Beth, who is frothing at the knickers at the sight of him and tries to get her Craigie a promotion. When Gemma shows up, the cat is out of the bag. Oh, the kit is out of the bag. Oh, uh, <laughs> foxes aren't cats. <laughs> kit and Gemma are siblings, and she can't help spilling when she sees Bernie and Nina Rolls later how much she'd like to fuck her son. So gross. 
The chat in the pub is light and friendly until Bernie and Dev come in. Billy suggests building bridges and Dev pulls up a couple of chairs without waiting to be asked. Bernie is allowed to calmly explain her story of regret and how she had no support at the time to help her when Kit was born. Paul still thinks, and this is the important thing I think for Paul, he still thinks that he's been robbed of the years that he could have got to know his brother and that kind of brings the meeting to an end and I think that really hits the nail on the head for Paul. He's only got months left. He was given between 6 and 12 months to live 7 months ago. Yeah. So, really, Not and the much. way that he's deteriorating, that really could Very be at, at any point. And he's right. He could have had years to get to know this guy and then decide that he didn't like him. But he's not been allowed that chance. Yeah. I get that. But he should just say, hey, I get a chance now and reconcile with his mom because there's this. And I don't think it has come up yet. At least I haven't heard anyone mention it yet. The fact that Kit has a different dad than the twins. Mm -hmm. And that that was a factor as well. That their dad was not going to raise someone else's kid and is a terrible person. Let's all remember how we were reminded of how terrible their dad is when he was on the show briefly. Whatever happened to him? Because I don't remember him actually going away. It looked like Bernie Dunham. Yeah, maybe. But anyway, you know, there are all these factors to this whole thing. And everybody is up in arms about it and overreacting and again acting like uh, you know not considering the fact that putting a child up for adoption is a is a horrible decision for any mother or parent to have to take and is not something done lightly and everybody's acting like if you give your child up for adoption you're essentially abandoning that child when he was not, he was not left at the fire station or outside a church with a door knocking. Yeah. But sort I, I, don't of thing. Know, I don't know that you seem to equate physical abandonment with emotional abandonment. Right. But everybody is acting like she did this horrible thing for selfish reasons. And like, it's the most, it's the worst thing you could ever do in your life to a child. And that's not necessarily the case, you know, and and it just it feels like nobody is giving Bernie a chance to explain. Nobody is recognizing the fact that Kit had a better childhood as an only child of fairly well off parents. Mm -hmm. He would never have been a detective if he had grown up in that house. No. He would be, you know, he'd be on jail. the other side yeah. of the of the bars, just like Gemma and Paul have been. You know, nobody is recognizing that, and nobody is really asking Bernie why she did it. Nobody is asking her to explain. They're just immediately rushing to, "You're a horrible, selfish person, and should be condemned because you had to make this choice." Yeah, it's it's not great. I think at this point, with everything that they're through and everything they've been through and they're currently going through, I think Gemma and Paul would be more likely to believe their own mother than this guy. Right, who, exactly. Who they met yesterday. Right, yeah. Yeah, they're, it's, their reactions do not jive with what we know about their personalities and about their relationship to their mother. Apart from the fact I can kind of believe Paul's side in it. Paul's side in it kind of makes sense to me. Gemma's not so much. But again, it's because of Paul's health. Yes. And not because of his personality. No. Outside, Dev tells Craig to stay well clear of Kit. He's a wrong one. And Gemma's secret brother as well. And this sets Craig's brain a chugging, and he reasonably quickly works out that this might explain why Kit spoke to the shoe shop guy the other week. 
So Craig approaches Kit with this in a vague way and kind of hints that he knows yeah. something about Kit that maybe Kit doesn't want him to know Like about. recognizes like. Mm-hmm. If you're a dirty cop and I'm a dirty cop, maybe we can be dirty cops together. And Kit, obviously not a Craig fan already, tells him to go fuck himself. Yes. And Friday, Gemma and Paul are buying funeral flowers for Kit's mum and because, let's remember, Kit's mum's dead. Yes. And refused Bernie's money when she offers. Later, Deb is angry about this and insists that she sends her own flowers in. Fuck Paul and Gemma. He reckons this could win Kit round. It's this so, is a terrible idea, It's Deb. a terrible idea, and it's so much the opposite of his advice the day before, which was give the kids space. Give them space, yeah. And now he's like, rawr, no, because then you'll lose them forever like I lost my older kids. Meanwhile, in the pub, Paul has lost movement in his left hand. He doesn't want Gemma to make this a big deal, but Bernie's in a nearby booth and she notices something's up before she can speak to him. Kit shows up and he's not thankful for Bernie's flowers at all. Kit wants Bernie to leave. Gemma wants that too. And so does Paul. So she and Dev leave the pub. And that's as far as we get on. Right. And Jenny is very nosy. (laughs) Yes, Jenny this week is just nosy. Yes. But it's nice to see her in it. Agreed. Yeah, I think we've picked the bones of that pretty well all the yes, way through that. Yes, I think that. we have. So yeah. let's move on to, not that I'm trying to save time here. Hmm. These stories will get the attention they deserve. Next story is Swain's work-life balance. I've kind of smooshed two stories together here. Yes. On Monday, Joel has slept poorly on Dee Dee's couch and he's got a sore neck. He mentions to Didi that he's thinking of letting the lease run out on his flat that he's currently in. Hint, hint. Hint, hint. Didi's in the beach roll later and talks to Toya about her celibacy and Joe's tenancy agreement about to run out. And then asks Adam to move out because no one remembered that he lived there in the first place. She breaks the news to Joel that he can move in and get his own room. She nips off for some bubbly while Joel texts, presumably Betsy, to promise her more money. On Friday... In Nina's roles, Kit bumps into Sarah and gives her a heads up that Swain is digging around the payment that Nathan got, the hush money. Sarah pretends that she doesn't know what he's talking about, but then insists that she's in the clear because there's no paper trail, they paid in cash. Right. Meanwhile, Maria is chatting to Gary about plans for Liam's birthday and for getting their hole. When Sarah shows up pretending that she has a factory question, but then she's interrupted when her phone rings. It's Swain and she wants to see Sarah right now. Right now. Swain. talk. So in, the question, in baby, so in the question room, Swain questions Sarah about Nathan's finances and claims that Nathan says that she paid it as hush money. Sarah plays dumb, which she's pretty good at, but then admits that she paid Nathan to leave Weatherfield. This wasn't money to get him to change his testimony, right. which is vitally important. This was just money to get him to leave town. Right. So he wants to know if the money came from Damon Hay. And Sarah looks like she's wavering because she can't say that it's Gary, but she doesn't want anyone to think it was Damon because then it's the money came money. from illicit means. So in speed dial, Gary's with the family celebrating Liam's birthday when he gets a text from Sarah asking to meet outside. So he can he concocts a story about uh, salty popcorn and nips mm. out uh, and she asks him to tell the police it were him what gave her the money. And their meeting is interrupted by Maria, so Gary and Sarah have to cover poorly. And I can't remember why they said that. Mm. Oh, yeah. Leah, uh, Sarah was asking how Liam was doing. Something like that. Yeah. And she was just walking by. She just happened to be walking by. But Maria's definitely on to them. Yes. Meanwhile, Betsy's in the factory on work experience and is impressing Fizz and seems to be confusing the fuck out of Kirk. She spends quite a bit of her time on her phone, though. When Carla catches her, she claims it's a fella and asks to keep DS Swain out of the picture here, which Carla agrees to do if she gets back to work. Carla says how impressed Fizz was with her work, and Betsy says, well, Fizz isn't as dozy as they look then. Betsy is mistaking Fizz for Kirk, it seems. (laughs) But later, Carla catches her again, and she's on her phone, and this time she just confiscates it like she's at school. End of the day, Swain arrives to pick Betsy up. Betsy says that she's got plans, but then Swain sees a text from someone JD on her phone. 
Joel Deering. Mm. Betsy says, is just someone that's nobody important. God, Mum, you're so embarrassing. Betsy and Carla agree she can come back to work tomorrow. Son's phone. Sweet. And that's as far as we get with that yes. this week. Betsy on the machine. Betsy on the machine tearing it up. Making, yeah. making a decent pair of knickers by the looks of things. Impressing people and talking ribbons around poor Kirk. <laughs> Which was I'm hilarious. not sure what Kirk was talking about in the first place. Something to do with potatoes, wasn't it? Maybe. And then how he always has a Chinese meal on a, on a right. Friday night. Yeah. Kirk, what are you talking about? <laughs> I do like Betsy. They've picked a really good actor to play Swain's daughter. Absolutely. That's for sure, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I do, I do like this whole, oh, Carla's got the phone. She's got to... She's going to find something out. And then, uh uh-oh, Swain's got the phone. She's going to find something out. And it does kind of seem like, because at that point, when she looks at the phone and asks who JD was, that's when she's like, nope, you're coming home with me and we're having dinner together. No ifs, ands, or buts. Get in the car, young lady. Sort of thing. Whereas before, she kind of seemed swayed. Imagine being a kid that age and your parents says, right, come on, we're going home for dinner. And then saying no to them. It's a different generation than ours. It is ours. a different generation, isn't it? Because I've got a clip around the ear for saying that. Yeah. You can't clip kids around the ear anymore. Nah. Not these days. No. Not with a woke, woke arati like snowflakes, am I right? Yeah, it's probably better that you don't get to physically <laughs> abuse your children anymore. <laughs> we um, turned there, out there's fine. There's pros and cons, right? We turned out fine. Or did we? Getting kicked out of the house at nine o'clock in the morning and told not to come back until dinner time yeah yeah i didn't walk around picking up old cigarette ends to make a whole cigarette out of cigarette ends that people had thrown away i didn't do that when i was 12 it's lucky you don't have like some horrible disease like black lung <laughs> that's a pirate isn't it Arr. That's black beard. Oh, black lug is that what must you get. Be what I'm thinking of. Black lug is what you get when you work in the coal mines and smoke cigarettes. I like Betsy. I think she's uh, precocious. I'm curious what her money's for. Well, it seemed like the last time it was just to just, buy chips and just to fuck around with this guy. Right? Yeah. I'm a little surprised that she's not intelligent enough to change the initials of uh, the guy in her phone. Yeah, I don't think she really cares. <laughs> and should she? Nuh-uh. She probably... It's not that big a deal to her, though, is it? No, it really isn't. She doesn't realise what, yeah, what the deal she's, is. Yeah, because she's playing him, let's not forget. I wrote in my blog post last week that they're playing each other and they both have a secret weapon. Yeah. His secret weapon is that he arguably kills young blonde women. Right. And her secret weapon... Is her mum. Is her mum, right. So that's a really interesting dynamic that's going on between the two of them. Yes, I agree. So I hope she goes back. I think think Gary's fucked as soon as... Because Maria's not going to let this go. She suspects something's going on between Gary and Sarah and they continually give her reason to be suspicious. Exactly. She's not dumb Maria anymore. She's Counselor Maria. Yeah. And how do you solve a problem like Maria? I wonder how many people in the street voted for her. As far as you're concerned, not Dev. (laughs) Or Sally. (laughs) All right, we'll move on to where there's a will. Just on Monday, George is on the phone to Eileen, paints a rosy picture of life back in the house, but Todd is fucking fuming and demands that George gets rid of his shite pronto, especially that Archie Shuttleworth picture. Yeah, either, and Mary needs room for jazzer size. Either, and she's holding a DVD. Either make up with Glenda or throw the shit out. So George goes to the rovers to complain about the stuff in Eileen, so Glenda presents him with a receipt for storage space, which is where the rest of his shit is. George is shocked that Glenda cares so little about his living arrangements, but she points out he lives with Eileen and that yeah. he got everything from their dad. Everything. Right. 
At this, Michael comes in and George asks him to do something to help, but Michael explains that he's dumped her thanks to the bullshit with the house and that, and this seems to calm George somewhat. He apologises for letting it get out of hand and tells Glenda she can have the house after all. Huzzah! Common sense has been finally Restored, delivered finally. to George. And, uh, I get, and I get to like him again. Yes. I, hated the, I hated the two of them fighting yeah, me too. anyway, but I really hated his stance on this. You can have anything you want so long as it doesn't affect me. Right, yeah. Well, that's nothing then. Right, exactly. So it's good that this is this is worked out. And it doesn't really affect him because he lives at Eileen's. A house that he's never in. Right. He doesn't. That I'm assuming go to he's, he's still paying like utilities and stuff on because. Well, he says he's paying his mortgage on it. Right, and how does he have a mortgage if it's a family house? Did he remortgage it for money? He must have remortgaged it for some reason at some point. Why? If they still have a mortgage on it, and it's a house that he inherited, because when did Archie die? It's been years, right? And one would assume that Archie was paying the mortgage for years before he died. Eh, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I don't think the length of the mortgage is... That's a bit of a red herring. Yeah. But anyway. And now I guess it's Glenda's problem. Yes. How she's going to fucking pay that with a barmaid's salary and whatever pittance she's making out of the whole... I was going to say double glammy. That's gone back a while. Hi. Um, she also has that twenty grand from, from George. Little big it. shots. That's what I was what we're trying to think shots. of, as you were yawning so hard that you sucked any hair that I have on my head. <sighs> <laughs> All right, we'll move on to the Yeti of Weatherfield. On Wednesday, a bearded Roy. <laughs> finally shows up in Roy's roles to the surprise of Nina and Yasmin. And he's wearing the dude's sweater. <laughs> but, but he doesn't hang around. He's just down for a white Russian. And then he's back <laughs> upstairs again. Where he can admire his rug, which really pulls the room together. <laughs> really does pull the room together. No man peed in it, for fuck's sake. <laughs> oh. Then Nina's day is further fucked in the eighth when Shona appears to pull out of her shift, leaving Nina in the lurch. She begs Roy to help, but he says he's not up to it, claiming to be recuperating. Nina is at her wit's end. Shona finally shows up to relieve her. David thinks that she should close up shop and just call Roy's bluff. But Yasmin suggests reverse psychology to jolt him out of his depression. And this seems to spark something in Shona. Why can't we just talk to him? Although well, they've tried that. Working. It doesn't seem to be working. I'm so sorry. I don't know why I am so tired already. I, I apologise. On Friday, there's a line at Nina's rolls as Nina struggles to handle the morning rush. Evelyn shows up and offers help, but ends up just getting in Nina's way. Frustrated, she goes to complain some more to Roy. Seems Shona's pulling a sickie to highlight the staff problems in Nina's rolls by becoming one. But Roy still refuses to budge, so Nina calls him an asshole and storms off in a huff. And Feel- he is. He is being an asshole. Oh, totally. And also that beard is just... It's well, not a beard. It's, it's, <laughs> it's not a beard. It's like not joined in the centre. It's so patchy. It's terrible. It's. Which is how you know it's real. Because it, it nobody would ever me, give him a fake beard that looks like that. Uh, is it worth mentioning an episode of Cheers from 30 years ago? <laughs> yes. When the, when the men had a beard growing competition and Cliff's beard looked kind of <laughs> like Roy's. Just... There was no moustache, there was nothing on the cheeks, there was nothing really on the chin. you think Cliff could, could grow a beard. Cliff? He looks, he looks like he could grow a beard. Cliff? Yeah. Who are you thinking of? Cliff, who does it like his wife. That's Norm. See, I knew you weren't thinking of Cliff. Cliff already has a moustache. He doesn't have a beard. No, but you said he couldn't, he, he couldn't even grow a moustache. You thought he was married. Because I was thinking that's, of Norm. I know, which, that's, which is what I said. I knew you weren't thinking of Cliff. Cliff's the mailman. Yes, John Ratzenberger, who is in Oh, you're a fucking expert. Every... You're a fucking expert on Cliff now. <coughs> anyway. 
<laughs> it's been a long time since Cheers was on television, my darling. And you were the one who wanted the, the, the beard competition story. I thought it was Woody who had a patchy beard. No, it's Cliff. Because you would think Woody would have a patchy beard because he's supposed to be like this man baby. And also, I don't think Woody Harrelson can grow a beard. I don't think I've ever seen him with a beard. Not a good one. Nina admits to Evelyn that Shona's thing is a ruse and she's worried that Roy will become a permanent recluse. Later, Nina burns toast because the toaster is fucked, but the alarm is enough to encourage Roy downstairs to help. Finally! And you know what? He's enjoying himself as he gets to interact with Kirk. Kirk's in it! Hey! And that's all that matters. Kirk's in it. He's in about three different storylines this week. He is. Evelyn is quietly worried about the nasty teens coming back or something like that. So Nina agrees to work through her break and keep her eye on Roy. He thinks Shona's illness has been a blessing in disguise. And that's as far as we get with that this week. Yes. About so high... Roy is finally, finally downstairs. That's helpful. Yeah, about high bloody time. Yes. Now if we can only encourage him to shave. To shave. Yes. I mean, I get that this is the physical manifestation of his inner turmoil. Right. As subtle as it is, right? Right. And also, like, this misconception that he has that if he just stays upstairs forever, then no one can misconstrue his personality. Or and think it's like, he's a pedophile, yeah. Roy, if you're like a hermit, that's not great either. No. That's, that's not giving people a good impression either. No. Uh, one thing that the show seems to be on our track for doing though because we went through a list of all the people that work at nina's roles and alex names came up right he's in the netherlands for some reason he's in amsterdam on a uh, <laughs> some kind of drug-fueled binge through the red light district they do this all the time with alex yeah that he's basically a drug-addled alcoholic yeah I don't know if I find it funny anymore. Because it's like Alex is the least likely to be on a stag do in Amsterdam. Right, yeah. Because they, they have... And I think a lot of people have this misconception about people with Downs. That, you know, that they're, they're essentially permanently children. So they can't drink alcohol and they can't smoke cigarettes. Or and they can't have adult, yeah. relationships and be adults. Um, that that girl that was in the Woody Harrelson movie about basketball, she's she's done some public service announcement sort of things, talking about that very thing. Like, I'm an adult, I can learn things, I can drink alcohol, I can have sex. Stop treating me like a child. Sort of thing. And they're brilliant. Because mm -hmm. she's brilliant. She's a very good actress. Um, yeah. Do they mention drugs? I thought they just mentioned Netherlands no, they, or Amsterdam. No, they don't mention drugs, but he's on a pub crawl in Amsterdam or something like that. And he's, I, he's, they just say he's in Amsterdam. No, I don't they don't. Think they've... They don't. They, they go a bit further by saying why he's in Amsterdam. I don't remember them saying why. They do. And they do this, whenever, when the last time he was in it, he was hungover. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I don't know. I... It, I don't, don't get me wrong, it's nice that it gets mentioned every now and again because right. it makes me think that it'll be in it. Right, I much prefer some point just to see him. And they had a little trait for him for a, a week or so where they just gave him these zinger one-liners. Yeah. I wonder, maybe that would be a better character trait for him rather than being an alcoholic. An alcoholic, yeah. Because the zingers were good. Yeah. Because he would just deliver it and they'd just wander off. <laughs> to right. Leaving people like, what the fuck was that? It does make you wonder, though, if if that may be misconstrued as, oh, haha, -ha, this guy with Down syndrome. Yeah, maybe it, yeah, it's, it's difficult. He's got these one-liners and then one just wanders off. Yeah, he's got to have... He's always kind of been kind of spicy with, with his language. Always been spicy. Yeah. yeah, and I like that. I think the problem is, is that Kathy's not in the show anymore, so he really has no real anchor mm -hmm. and family and something to have a storyline with. Why don't they give Alex a storyline? I'm sure. I'm sure there's lots they could do. You know, it's it's like again, it's like the thing with Bobby that you know they're like, oh, 
isn't it great that Bobby's on the show? So now we have disability visibility on the show. And it's like Alex and Izzy are right there. Mm -hmm. Give them storylines. You know, not that I don't like Bobby, because I do like Bobby. But uh, now Bobby is a person that once again seems to be on the show and then off the show. And now, you know, we have a whole week where really there's no disability visibility unless you count Paul. Mm. So it's like, if you're going to do this, if you're going to pat yourself on the back for having disabled actors on the show and disabled characters, then make them visible. Make them more visible than they are at the moment. Mm -hmm. Because there's three of them now. We should see at least one of them on the show. If it's a factory shot, Izzy should be there. If it's a, and so should Bobby, because Bobby also works there. You know, it seems, it seemed this week that Fizz and Betsy were the only ones working in that factory and Kirk. No wonder they're like nearly going under all the time. The nearly going underworld. Ha ha ha. Ha ha ha. <laughs> Kit. I like the, the bit that I do like about this though is. Out of everybody that's on the show, of all the characters that are kind of recurring to some degree or another, Alex seems to be the one that has a life away from the show right? that we never see. Yeah. Kind of like Simon and, did. And, and doesn't get caught up in the bullshit that's going on in other people's right. storylines. He just turns up, does his job, says something spicy, then fucks off. Yeah. And I don't know if that's great or not. It's something. Because, like... These people should be his friends and not just his co-workers. No, I do, I do like that he doesn't care. He should still have friends. Oh, he can have friends. I think he does have friends. I think he would count Roy as being a friend. But he doesn't want anything to do with Roy's... You uh, never see Roy and Alex together outside of the shop. You never see Alex outside of Roy's roles. Never. Whereas you used to... When Kathy was still on the show. Occasion very occasionally, but you would still see it. Interesting. Well anyway. Anyway. Kind of went out. on that tangent. Roy's out. He's working again. No doubt next week it'll all come round to bite him on the arse. But maybe he'll shave. Next up in our penultimate storyline is credit where it's due. Just a few scenes here, and I was trying to fit it in somewhere else, but it didn't really fit. On Wednesday, Shona's bunked off work and is chatting to Bethany about her credit card fraud thing from weeks ago. Yeah, remember That's that? Still it's still thing. happening. Remember how we didn't care about that a few weeks ago? Yeah, we still don't well, care. Well, it's back again and we still don't care about it. Shona spots a supermarket charge and Bethany's like, yeah, well, so what? Shona wonders if there'd be CCTV. So Bethany, ah. ever the optimist, gives the supermarket a call. In fact, she gives all the shops a call and... Like us, no one is interested. Yeah, but they're also and, and they also they cite like digital privacy and stuff. And she's like, "Yeah, well, nobody cared about my digital privacy when they stole my credit card number." And well, two wrongs don't make a right, Bethany. Hmm. And it's data protection. Yeah, that same thing. The company that she used to work for have given her two weeks to repay the debt. Shona, however, has managed to find a pizza place willing to check their ancient CCTV. So she's left with a lead. I do like how, and that's as far as we go with that, I do like how everyone seems to assume that Bethany's guilty of doing this. <laughs> right, yeah. Anyway. That she's the one who did it. She's like, I didn't do it. I don't eat pizza. <laughs> I don't know why I'm doing that for No. That sounds nothing like Bethany or anybody else for Didn't that matter. Barely sounded human. <laughs> but hey, I was kind of hoping that they'd forgotten about this. So who's behind the credit card fraud then, do you think? Because it's got to be somebody we know. A lot, a lot of people are thinking that it's racist Kelly. But I'm that like... she's not dead? That she's not dead and she somehow was able to steal Sarah's credit card number and that's how she's living. But I don't, I guess they were in the same room together 
enough that racist Kelly could have swiped it from her wallet. Well, she stole from her bag. That's why she got right. sacked, remember? Yeah. So maybe she didn't get caught with the credit card, just with the cash. It's possible, I suppose. Well, it's interesting the things that get mentioned, the, the businesses that get mentioned. It's a supermarket and a pizza place. It's not exactly... You know, you're not going out and buying a Fender guitar or anything. Or no, that's what you would do. I'd buy Gibson, I think. <laughs> I've already got a Fender. <laughs> a lovely, lovely guitar. Look at it. All butterscotch blonde. Three pickups. Yeah. Most Telecasters don't have that middle one, but mine does. <sighs> anyway. Anyway. Yeah, so it's interesting that it's just kind of sustenance kind of credit card fraud. Right. Like buying necessities and stuff. Yeah. Maybe it could be racist, Kelly. Maybe. We she still haven't steal. seen a body. She did steal something. Yep. We thought it was a fiver. Yeah. That, that's what she got And she fired insisted for. the fiver was hers. Remember that? Hmm. Well, that's got me thinking there, but then... Joel really looked like he finished her off. Yeah, but we all but again, we don't see a body. No. And we don't see him hit her. No. So you've got to be very careful about what you think happened. Right? And uh, I don't know that the show's been coy about this. But they're not really saying anything no. about it. And they're very careful not to refer to Joel as being a killer. No. And when Joel had his little, or the actor had his little bit to camera after that episode, he said, well, yep, it was me. Right. But then doesn't say... I killed her. What he did. He didn't right. say, yep, it was me who killed racist Kelly. Yes. He didn't say that. Nope. So they've been very careful. I they suspect are. that racist Kelly is still alive. Yeah. And now that you're mentioning this, I think this is odds-on favourite for being the... um. For being the the explanation to this. Yes. Oh, I'm quite interested about this now. I wasn't before because it was just Bethany. Right. And really, who gives a fuck about Bethany? Not me. No. No. Moving on then. Our final storyline tonight. And oh. It's a doozy. Oh my god. It's a doozy. Buckle up, buckaroo. <laughs> Don't you have to have the lisp in there? No. <laughs> it's reality coding bites. On Monday, at the flat, Toya tells Leanne about her plans to move out and Leanne is oddly upset by the thought and didn't think they paid her enough to allow her to do that. At work, Amy's complaining about her involvement in a number of different storylines all at the same time. Her mother isn't coming back and... And also, her mother wants her to take over the flower shop, which, fuck you, Mary... And take over the finances and everything and run a flower shop while she's still in school and also doing this radio thing. Although, did she mention the radio thing? I don't think she did. And also working in the bistro. And looking after granddad. Right. Which she isn't doing very much of, but... Tracy's a bitch. Leanne goes, breathe, Amy, just breathe, calm. Right. I think I know a way that'll... Help you relax. <sighs> but not like that. Yeah. I've got a video to show you. <laughs> but not like that. But not like that. I've got this little thing that it says it's a massager, but anyway. It'll also help her find perspective. And she takes her off for a bit of filthy uploading. Later, Leanne nonchalantly mentions to Toya that Amy's in the office watching one of the Institute seminars and Toya has to bite her tongue. As later she overhears Amy saying how much she enjoyed it and Leanne coaxing her to attend a real life event. Toya tries to speak to Amy about this but Amy reminds her that she's a fucking adult and she knows what she's getting into so suck my balls Toya and mind your own beeswax. And also Tracy's her mum so you can't offend her. Right. The show's asking us to believe a couple of things about Amy and Sabrina that I just don't see being true. No. That Amy, for a start, would be remotely interested in this. Yeah. And Sabrina would fall for Joel's charms. So right. you've got these 
fairly switched on young female characters who are being asked to kind of behave like dumbasses. Yeah. And and fall for the wily ways of an older man. Yeah. In the shape of Joel and Rowan. Rowan. Yeah, not cool. I'm not sure Amy is... I, yeah. I could see it and I, and I forgave it to a certain extent because of the the distress and the vulnerability and that she's so that overwhelmed at the through. moment but well the fact that amy is really overwhelmed at the moment i think is is why we're supposed to believe that she might get sucked into this but she also seems to be she's very careful with it she's like yeah that video was very good and i think it was really helpful but she doesn't want to pay to get in and she's like very non-committal in her responses to Leanne and to Rowan. You know, she's being polite to both of them, you know, in listening to them. Mm. But she's not being very, she's not like, oh, yes, yeah, sign me up to either one of them. But she is given at the time of day. Right. But again, this is her boss and her boss's friend. Mm. She could be just being polite and not wanting to lose her job. In that case, I think she would side with Toya and she doesn't seem to be doing that. Well, no. What she says to Toya is like, yeah, I'm an adult. I can see through this. No, she also said, yeah, Leanne warned me that you might you might be coming on like this about it. And, you know, just don't bother. Right, because I'm an adult and I can make up my own mind. She doesn't seem to be falling for it hook, line, and sinker is what I'm saying. I think she's threatening to it. And, and I, I really hope that she doesn't, but I can see her, for the purposes of this storyline only, being that person that goes for it. On Wednesday, Toya is up and feeling oddly sick in the morning <sighs> after having had disappointing sex with Nick. Weird. What on earth could Weird. be the cause for but this sickness in the morning? She's feeling sharp pain. She's not vomiting. She's not, but she's feeling sick. Yeah. Leanne, though, is bright and breezy, and she's the one to take Sam to school while Toya and Nick act weird among each other. A work later, Toya's stomach is still dodgy while Leanne tries to sign Amy up to the Institute, but then Toya takes a spill in the dining room and Leanne sends her home. But at home, while Nick is off to buy some tomato soup, she collapses again, but this time, it's worse. I've fallen, and I can't get up! We're sending help immediately, Mrs. Fletcher. And seemingly focused on her fallopian tubes, Nick gets back and helps her onto the couch, and he calls Toya an ambulance. She's like, no, my name is Toya. Toya, you're an ambulance. <laughs> oh, dear. So, in the hospital, Nick is with Toya in accident and emergency. He thinks that she maybe has an ulcer after their disappointing misery sex. There's still a bit of longing between the two of them, though. Did you sense that? The two of them still kind of... Yeah. They're looking at each other in a certain way still. Yes, yes. But I noticed that before they got to the hospital. Meanwhile, in the bistro, Rowan is visiting to tell her about some assessment that she has tomorrow... I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't catch what the assessment was at the time, but I, they were clearer when they were talking about it later on in the uh -huh. week. And it's uh, a malware assessment, which is hilarious. Which is pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah. They're they're really really <laughs> sticking to this computer. Yes. Metaphor here. Yeah. It's so stupid. It's malware, and she's going to get assessed in it. Amy comes in and confirms that she might be interested in joining the Institute. And then David comes in and tells Leanne about Toya. So at the top, at the hospital, Leanne has shown up as the doctor delivers the news. Toya... Delivers the news. I know. That wasn't accidental. <laughs> no kidding. Toya, congratulations are in order. You're up the fucking spout. Next jizz is that good. He's the new Steve. Toya is adamant that she can't be. And the doctor says, well, I'm just a doctor. What the fuck do I know? Let's do an ultrasound. 
but they can only do it tomorrow for dramatic purposes. Right, yeah. It's an emergency. You're in the emergency. You're having these sharp pains, which could possibly be an ectopic pregnancy, which would mean that we would need to operate immediately or else you will die when your tube bursts. But we'll just wait until tomorrow to figure out whether or not that's the case. What the fuck? So at this point, at this point, Toya can only get pregnant if she's been raped or if she's getting her hole off of her brother-in-law. And I'm like, surely to God we aren't doing this. Right, yeah. As I said to you, when this was happening, this sucks because... A whole chunk of Toya's personality is the fact that all she wants is a child, like she's some witch in a fairy tale, and she can't have one. So for them to be doing this essentially just to further along the cult storyline is really terrible and heartless. Yeah, there's confusion on my part anyway as to... What are the reasons for not only doing this, but for for also doing the digging up the 20-year-old baby story? Because the two things are part of the same thing. The the two, the dead baby and this potential new baby. It's like, if you're going to make her pregnant, did we need the 20-year-old dead baby? What, What purpose did that serve? Well, they both served as purposes for Rowan to manipulate her and to hold her down and to get her to shut up. Right, but that's... Theoretically. But that's the... Those are such slender reasons to change this entire character that nothing else could be thought of. So we need need to to get a 20-year-old baby dug up and we need to get this infertile woman pregnant somehow yeah to further along this uh cult storyline it just if they're going to do those things for toya can't they be for a toya storyline that I right mean, this is just it just feels like it's so removed and the whole reason that either of these things are happening is so that rowan has something on toya right can we have something that's not baby related and still make this work? Surely we can. Yes. Surely it's possible to yes. do this without without it being baby related. Because I remember, and I think I remember seeing this quite recently, Georgia Taylor gave an interview a number of years ago about Toya and her, and this, this aspect of her personality and this aspect of her body, I guess, of Toya's body where... She doesn't get pregnant, and and Georgia Taylor was kind of adamant that she didn't want, didn't want any medical baby. This right, because that kind of detracts from the whole point of having this character who really, really wants a baby and can't have one. Right, somebody who forms their whole personality on that. Right, and and it does seem like the the whole. Uh, ability to sell this has come down to Georgia Taylor being able to act it. Right. Which I've said before, she's come desperately close to making me believe this, despite the fact that I absolutely hate it because of the the retcon from it. Right. It's great that, that she's been able to get this close to it, but my God, this whole thing goes against Toya's character right goes against the way the actor sees the character right and the way that the audience sees the character and needs the actors i guess complicity is too strong a word but you know what i mean that to be able to sell this ridiculous storyline we have to rely on the fact that georgia taylor's a really good actor right and can make us care about it right and it's, and all let's not forget also, Rowan can have a couple of things on her. Right, yeah. And just at this point, I don't know, there's part of me that's glad that she's pregnant, but then I'm thinking this is never going to last. Right. And all the things that it does against her character is just right. totally not worth it. Yeah. And also it's going to lean into, it's going to lead to a rift with her sister. 
which already has a rift. And even at and also, this is a storyline that has been done before. The sharing of a man between the two of them and also babies and stuff. And Leanne having babies and Toya not having babies. And well, Oliver stuff. was a miracle baby as well. Right. And also from a one night stand, which Toya, or Leanne is quick. Leanne's whole like just. No, we'll get to this, but <laughs> Leanne is keen to know who the father is, but Toya tells her to mind her own fucking business. Seriously. Leanne thinks this is everything Toya has ever dreamed of, and she goes off to pack a bag for Toya. Nick offers to do it, but Leanne says, huh, like Toya wants you raking about in her underwear. Yeah. Aye. Already done. <laughs> done and done. Yes. So she goes off to pack that, which allows Nick and Toya to chat about the mess they're in. Toya's very honest, says this is her last and possibly only chance to have a baby, so she's going to keep it. Nick is supportive, but doesn't know how this is going to play out. He doesn't know if he can have another secret baby. Meanwhile, at the bistro, Rowan has been working on Amy. When Leanne comes in and she quickly spills Toya's news to him. She's right, pregnant. she has not learned. She's not learned. It's like, okay, do you not remember how mad Toya was when you shared all of the Rose stuff? Right. And how you apologized and promised never to do that again. Do you remember that, Leanne? Interesting, says Rowan, taking notes. Leanne hightails it back to the hospital with supplies and hundreds of questions about the father. Toya politely tells her to fuck off again and to suck her balls. Back in the street, on Maxine's bench, Nick spills to David that Toya's pregnant with his baby and he doesn't know what to do. I don't know, Nick, nope, maybe ask Gail can, for her opinion? Nobody can keep a secret here. Well, seriously. Nick does need somebody to talk to in all it's this. It's true. And it's, it's just lucky that David's back from Africa. <laughs> this is not... I know, but it's funny. Is it? Yes. It's funnier uh, than your kit joke. See, that's Kit Kat, and you continually think that it's uh, something to do with a fucking fox for some reason. A baby fox is a kit. Yeah, but a Kit Kat is a biscuit. So, at the end of Wednesday, I'm thinking this pregnancy isn't going to go to anywhere near term. I'm thinking ectopic pregnancy. And I'm thinking ectopic pregnancy as well. I'm like, well, that's interesting because I don't know an awful lot about that. Maybe I don't need to know an awful lot about that, but hey, at least it sounds like something that's a little bit new. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of expecting that that's the way that this is going to go. Right. Because the idea, Toya is like, what? Because she said that she had her period three weeks ago. Right. So the the viability of this doesn't seem huge. Me right. being a fertility expert, etc. But it, it doesn't sound like it's got much chance. So on Friday, next taking Sam to school. And we learn that taking Sam to school just means walking him to the bus stop. Yes. And this pities all over Leanne's plans to see Rowan and some other losers about the Institute stuff, the malware thing. Right. So Nick reluctantly agrees to... Um, to go sit with Toya. Yes, while Sam talks about chess. Poor Sam. Everything that he says these days is about chess. Later in the bistro, David comes to talk more about the Toya situation. David suggests that he fights for Leanne, but Nick wonders if she would fight for him. And at the moment, I think that's clear. Yeah, she no. wouldn't. And no, she's she kind of she's kind of made that abundantly clear. I think. Right. Yeah. It. I think, especially this week, it becomes clear that Leanne really does not care about her family at she all. She cares about herself. Right. First and foremost. And, that and she's then been she cares brain- about her family. Right. She's been brainwashed into thinking that the stuff she does at the Institute is for her family, and it's not. Yeah. At the hospital, Toya is worried about her pains and the possibility of an ectopic pregnancy. Ah. And at that point, I'm thinking, well, it there ain't we that then. Yeah. It's got to be something else. Right, because- yeah. When they mentioned it, I was like, oh, okay, so it's not going to be that. Never yeah. mind now. So she's taken for a scan, and there's an hilarious mix-up when the nurse thinks Nick is the dad. A dad, says Leanne. Right. So during the scan, the nurse spots something and says, oh, I just, I just need to go into the next room and tie my shoelace for a bit. Oh, oh, this is never a good sign. And Toya spots it. But the check is to confirm Toya 
No baby. Not, are, are, not only are you not pregnant, you've never been pregnant. And instead thinks something has caused a false positive. Toya is crushed. Leanne is Mardi. Nick is literally crying, pretending that it's all about family and Sam and stuff. Right, yes. But he is crying and it is kind of funny. Oh, I thought it was sweet. And also kind of funny. Well, maybe. <laughs> the consultant comes in and tells Toya that she's got a growth on her ovaries. It looks like she has, perhaps, ovarian cancer. And they're going to do a biopsy right after the break. So Leanne nips off to tell Rowan that she can't make the Institute thing to his face for some reason. Right, because she can't get him on the phone. Which again allows Nick and Toya to chat. Except they don't really chat. Toya puts on a brave face. Nick goes for a coffee and then she has a panic attack. And I thought this scene was... This scene is why Toya and why Georgia Taylor is able to sell this story to me because right. it was so good. It was. And it was really good. On, honestly, Ben Price does an absolutely fantastic job as well. Yes. But Toya does something where she's kind of biting her lip and pretending to smile and says, mm-hmm. Right. And it's just the most natural, believable thing. Yeah, and, it's heartbreaking. Oh, and then as soon as Nick's gone, she just breaks down. Right, yes. And you almost forget that she murdered her husband. Yeah. <laughs> Leanne meets Rowan in the swanky new rape hotel set. He says it's imperative that she attends this malware session thing. This will help Toya more once she's gone through this. And this seems to involve Leanne being blindfolded, put in the centre of a circle of people and sacrificed to Willow. Right, uh, while everyone else is having an orgy around her. Yeah. Because it is now eyes wide shut. It's eyes wide shut, yeah. Back in the hospital, Nick reveals how much he actually wanted the baby. And Toya's kind of surprised by this. Mm -hmm. and, and she says, even at the expense of what this would do to Sam and what it would do to Leanne. And, yeah. And he's like, yep. Yeah. Sam was funny because it's like, I'm going to have a cousin. Yeah. And he makes yeah, this, not really. And he makes this little sign out of Scrabble pieces, and it's adorable. I, I thought it was uh, periodic table things. Well, they were little squares glued onto a piece of paper. They were certainly that. So maybe it was both. Maybe it was using Scrabble squares to make the periodic table spell out "Congratulations on your baby, Auntie Toya." Which is very, very early to be doing that. Yeah, no kidding. Who told Sam? <laughs> Who thought it was a good idea to tell Sam? Jesus, do you tell Sam nothing? You tell Sam nothing. He's already had enough heartbreak in his wee little life. Toya's whisked away alone because Leanne is doing the silly thing at the rape hotel where the people all shout insults at Leanne. While she's blindfolded. That they read on Corapedia until she admits that she's broken. When she agrees to be better, everyone gives her positive feedback. In tears, Leanne screams. And remember, this is in a conference room at the rape hotel that she wants to be free. Ceremony over. She looks shaken and she actually looks like she's about to start crying again until yeah. she hugs Rowan and she seems to find some comfort there. Yes. But she is thrilled to learn that she's now level six because some assholes shouted at her for a bit. At the hospital, the procedure is over and Toya can go home to wait for results. So Nick takes the afternoon off to take care of her, but not like that. Back at the flat, Leanne comes in and says that she knows Toya has cancer, has just buried her 20-year-old dead baby, has been conned out of her money by Rowan and everything. But she's And just... thought she was going to have a baby and now she's not going to have a baby. But Leanne has just hit level six and so has won an extra life. Nick tells her to shut her fucking yapper and Toya goes for a lie down. Leanne says that she was doing all this for Toya. Nick says that she did it for herself and leaves. He goes to tell David that Toya's not pregnant and might have cancer instead and he's sad about it and he's about done with Leanne who has turned into someone he doesn't even recognise. He has a quick wee cry as we end this week's episodes. And David asks him if he's in love with Toya. And he says, I don't know. He says he doesn't know. When yeah. I think. I think he knows. I think he looks like he is. Yeah. Oh, Oof. what did you make of all that then? It sucks because not only did the show manipulate Toya's emotions, 
with the storyline. They also manipulated our emotions with the storyline. And they're not fucking Pixar, so they need to cut that out. They are not Pixar. This is, this is true. They are not Pixar. Pixar's the only one who's allowed to manipulate us emotionally so, so in that what we way? cry. You know, by the whole, oh, she's going to have a baby. Oh, she's going to finally have a baby. How do we feel about that? Because that's like totally antithetical to the whole character and what the character stands for and the, all of the stuff that we've been through with the character. And oh, well, no, she's not going to have a baby. Well, then what's going on? She may die from ovarian cancer. Mm. It's like, we already have a dying character. Stop. Or she's going to lose her ovaries. And, you know, there's going to be a moment where she's going to be like, I don't want to lose my ovaries. And yet my ovaries are useless to me. Right. So maybe just take them away. Yeah. And I think that's what's going to happen. I don't don't think for a moment that Toya's dying or or is going to die here. Well, you never know. You never know. But I don't really feel it. I I feel like to take her ovaries out, does she have a menopause then? Either way, the ship, she the would baby have to have ship, f- has finally right. sailed she, for good. She would have to have a full hysterectomy, I think, for her to immediately go into menopause. But I'm not really sure about that because it's not just your ovaries that control all of that hormonal hmm. garbage. Either way, the baby ship has sailed. Yes, the baby factory, although it has been mothballed for some time. Yeah. Is finally demolished for yeah. good, and and any hope of them doing something in the future where Toya has a baby is, right. is then taken away with it. So right. unless she does IVF, well, she's done done that plenty of times. Yeah, it's true. Without success, so yeah, they have been playful think, with her emotions a little bit here. Yeah, I think now it becomes a more interesting story because it's a story about. I mean, it's an interesting story, but it's also a story that we've done with Leanne and Toya before, where they're both in love with the same man. So, Do you think Leanne is still in love with Nick? I think she thinks she's still in love with Nick. I don't think she is in love with Nick. No, I don't think so either. But I think she thinks that she... Because, let's remember, she thinks... All of this stuff she's doing at the Institute makes her a better partner and a better sister mm-hmm. and a better mom. None of that is true, but she has been manipulated into believing that. Yeah, and she's had weeks of people telling her the opposite. Right. And very clearly tonight, where Nick just tells it, shut up. Right. You need to stop talking about this. She also has this person and these people telling her the opposite. And she's been sucked into this group. And this is what cults do. They separate you from your family by telling you what you want to hear. As opposed to your family who are telling you what you don't want to hear, but what you need to hear. Yeah. So I like that it's feeling a bit more culty now. I was going to say, it does I feel do far it. more culty. We have cult members. We don't have white robes, but we did have a blindfold. And that's we, got to we, count for We got something. a blindfold, so... A Quite tattooed, a nice wee blindfold, actually, that had a little bit cut out for the nose. Yeah, tattooed vagina is not far behind. Do you know, if nobody gets their vagina tattooed, I don't think I'm going to be complaining. <laughs> I think I'm probably quite good. But the cult thing is getting, as far as I can make out on Twitter, which isn't always the best guide, is getting torn apart by people who hate it. Yeah, but if, if Emrys Cooper is moving back to the United Kingdom because of his role on Coronation Street Mm -hmm. kind of feels like the cult's not going away anytime soon. Oh, I don't think it is. He's moved his animals back. (laughs) That is a lengthy process that can be quite stressful. Six months in quarantine. Yeah. Poor wee things. No, I I agree. I think the, the cult thing has finally started to behave like how it was supposed to behave all along i think this is the stuff that we've been missing to take this a bit more seriously i've actually found the blindfolded leanne bit 
almost distressing to watch. Yeah, it was very disturbing. It was very disturbing while these people are like shouting at her and she's crying and she's begging them to stop and they're not stopping. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, it was really disturbing for her to just automatically switch to, oh, yay, everybody loves me. I'm so happy now. While she is in the middle of that circle being shouted at and crying and begging for people to stop, at any time she could have torn that blindfold off and and walked away. Yeah, and she doesn't. And I think that kind of speaks volumes about how absolutely how deeply she's immersed in this. Uh huh. Yep. I keep on going back to this. Leanne said to Nick, "I would never cheat on you." It sounded more, or now sounds more like just a platitude that you say, huh, platitude, kind of to make the other person feel a bit bad about themselves right. more than, more than and anything it's else also, rather than something that she truly believed and she's also saying i would never cheat on you but she does not say i will never leave you and i think that's a very interesting difference you know she would leave she, because she would leave him because she is leaving him bit by bit mm. so if she did if she were involved in something sexually with a member of the cult, I don't think she, that she would feel like that was cheating. No, probably not. Because it would be part of an upload or something. Or a download, so to speak. An up and download? A jiggle it all about load? Well, you're downloading sperm into your vagina. I, are you, I think you're uploading that. Well, one person is downloading it and one person is uploading it. Yeah. I think we're going to disagree on who's doing what. No, I, th- I think the way that, that Toya and Nick are looking at each other definitely more than hints that there is kind of electricity between them. I always thought that Nick and Leanne were each other's lobsters. They were childhood sweethearts. They were married when they were in their teens. And this is why he came back, was because right. he always loved Leanne. It's always been Leanne. But, right, but, and she almost died. But maybe it's she not... She got hit by a car twice. Maybe it's not Leanne anymore. And that's sad. It is sad. But again, Leanne is not Leanne anymore. No, she isn't. And in fairness to the cult, Leanne hasn't been Leanne in quite... Leanne hasn't been Leanne since Oliver died. No. And she she will admit that, I think. Yeah, she's never come back. And the, her whole argument for the cult is that she finally feels like herself again. She finally has permission to be happy again. Mm. And why can't her family be happy for her that she's found a way back? Because she can't see that this isn't a way back. It's, it's a way, it's f- furthering her even more. Yes. I did like this storyline this week, even though it manipulated me, and even though it made me swear at Coronation Street quite a bit, on on Wednesday. Yeah, by the end of I it, was, I didn't mind it. I was genuinely surprised that it was potentially cancer. That yeah, that surprised me. Yeah, and yeah, I, I think I think the way that it was done and the emotion that it was right. delivered with kind of goes a long way to to making it kind of sit okay with me. But yeah, we will see where the cult goes. Yes, if anything's going to bring Tracy back, it's her daughter joining a cult. Oh, maybe, yeah. Mm. She'll kill Rowan. Oh, so this week we've potentially got a line back to racist Kelly and Tracy. Yes. I tell you, weeks like this don't happen very often. No. But that was the week that was Coronation Street. Helen, what was your moment of the week? <laughs> and it's got to be, surely, it's got to be Nick and Toya. Well, what part of Nick and Toya? The bit just before she has a panic attack. Yes, I agree. Because that was where, because I watched this earlier on this morning and asked Georgia Taylor just knocking this out of the park. Right, yes. It was exceptionally good. Yes, it was. All right. That and is we're not our... biased at all. <laughs> no, I just adore Georgia Taylor. Yes. And that was our moment of the week. Another week. Your boring moment of the week. 
I almost feel like it's it's Bethany talking about the list of places where her credit card was used. And yet that may be furthering another storyline. So it's a helpful thing. But also, I think, you know, her listing the different places that was kind of boring. It's Kirk talking about potatoes. Is it? Because neither one of us can remember exactly what he said about potatoes. There you go. And it seemed to endear him to er, endear him to Betsy and make Betsy feel like more part of the team. Do you think that? Because I thought she kind of started taking the piss out of him. Right. She was taking the piss out of him. And then he, he didn't realize. Yeah. And he didn't. Which is kind of nasty. And he didn't realize. But she seems to take the piss out of people that she likes. Like Sabrina and her mom. Well, I don't think she likes her mom at all. And Fizz. I don't think she likes Fizz either. Why wouldn't she like Fizz? Everybody likes Fizz. Fizz is great. I don't think Betsy cares for Fizz. She called her Dopey. There are worse dwarves for her to call her. Everybody loves Dopey. Dopey's a twat. (laughs) So what was your first thing? was a hot take dopey's a twat yes if anybody's a twat it's grumpy no wonder grumpy's grumpy he's got to fucking deal with dopey <laughs> what was your thing before uh bethany listing out the places her credit card has been used yeah okay i can go with that i don't really care fine for a moment of the week i forgot to do my poll again this week that's all right. I'll have been interested to see what people thought. That's fine. Do you want to know what? Do you, do you want to know my rating? I do. What was your score out of 10? Mm-hmm. Six. I'm going a big old seven and a half. Ooh. I thought it was really good this week. I enjoyed an awful lot of it. I thought Wednesday just absolutely knocked out the park. Yeah. I thought it was a good week. I just don't like being manipulated. And I also don't appreciate Gemma and Paul's reaction to a woman that they've known their whole lives and believing somebody they only met five minutes ago instead. Yeah, I, I can I can be angry about that and still be happy about the Steve and Tim stuff and to be happy about, well, not happy, impressed at the way that the, the Toya storyline mm-hmm. went. So, yeah, I think... Uh, Big old seven and a half for me. I thought yeah. it was a pretty good week. I did appreciate the Godfather reference. I just wish that bust looked more like Tommy O and was solid. Yes. They're trying to cut corners. And it's obvious. Well, then maybe they shouldn't have this storyline. Maybe it should have been a portrait you instead think, of a bust. I think that may be even more expensive to put together. Not really. Just print it out. You just need a plaster like palace Archie. mold of... Tommy O's head. Yeah, but then you need to give it weight and you have to make it look like Tommy O that didn't look like Tommy O. This episode was brought to you with thanks to our friends of the podcast, Daisy, French, Helen, Pickles, DT, Trisha, Wendy, Noel, Canadian Helen, Christy, Shandy, English Victoria, Aurora Yvonne, Heather Westerfield, Russell Whiting, Jackie B and Brittany Porter. Thank you so much, everybody. We really appreciate it. If you've ever realised that you can't grow a beard but yet still insist on trying to grow a beard, Writing to tell us about it. We're the talk of the street at gmail.com and we're at Corey Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Threads and Blue Sky. You can shout me and Helen a coffee or become a friend of the podcast by heading to ko-fi.com, that's ko-fi.com slash the talk of the street or patreon.com slash the talk of the street. Check out vogel.co.uk for links to our merch store, YouTube channel and blog. And if you're so inclined, please leave a rating and a review on the iTunes or your podcast provider of choice. And be sure to check out our pop culture sister podcast, The List of Lists. Oliver! Thanks for making it to the end of another episode and we will be back next week with more Talk of the Street. Talk of the Street. Bye. Cheerio.